loans with investors seeking a financial and social return. Please welcome to the stage Mr. David Klein. Hi there. Um, a lot of us think about disruption in the sense of disrupting industries. But I'd like to talk to you about a different kind of disruption. Uh, it's a disruption that is very rarely talked about, but I think probably the most important. And that's the disruption of you. What I mean by that is uh, behind every disruption is a disruptor. And someone who knows exactly who they are. Somebody who knows what makes them tick. Somebody who has a set of core values that help them make decisions in ambiguous situations. Somebody who has the capacity and the mental fortitude to face the resistance that they will undoubtedly face uh, when disrupting something. So how do you, how do you become a disruptor? I, I think you become a disruptor not by thinking about disruption, but by finding what you're passionate about, by finding your purpose. What is that problem that you really want to solve so badly that you would commit your life to? If you can answer these questions, then I believe you are in a position to disrupt. So who am I? Why am I talking to you about this? Um, I find myself in a fortunate position to have started a company uh, that most recently raised over $100 million to fix the broken student loan market. It's called Common Bond. My story doesn't start there, far, far from it. Um, I actually had to, it took a lot of time uh, and a lot of experience to unlearn a lot of what we're taught when we're young. Um, that keeps us in that constrictive mental frame, uninspired, with not much purpose. And once I unlearned those things, it took even more time and more experience to finally commit to those things, to commit to the thing that I found purpose in. It was in finding that purpose that I generated the capacity and mental fortitude to face a ton of resistance along the way in starting our company. Uh, my, my story doesn't really get interesting until uh, I, started, I started college. Um, and I'm going to get this clicker to that slide. Um, it doesn't get too interesting until I started college. Um, and in college, I came upon uh, a decision in senior year. Um, and it was a decision between Paris or McKinsey. Um, a very fortunate position to be in, albeit, uh, but an agonizing one nonetheless. I had an opportunity to teach English as a teaching assistantship in Paris. I also had this opportunity to work, work full time at McKinsey uh, Consulting. Um, I agonized over this decision for about a week, and I finally chose Paris. Um, a lot of people thought it was crazy, including my own family. After all, how can you turn down an offer from Kinsey? Um, but I had a very strong calling uh, to go to Paris to teach English. I had a very strong gut feeling uh, to go, and so I, I went with it. And it ended up being one of the best decisions I had ever made in my life. Because that year I discovered that while it was one of the best years of my life, it was also actually one of the poorest years of my life. And that was, that was incredibly moving for me. That completely changed my perspective of how I thought life worked. Um, and it, it was one of these years where I realized that my happiness was derived from meaningful connection with people, with others, appreciating who I was and getting and having an opportunity uh, that, that allowed for self-discovery and self-expression. Um, what I learned, so what I'll, what I'll read here is the first week I was, I was in Paris, I was reading the, the Metro newspaper, it's what you get on the subway every morning. Um, and I read it, I'm a Gemini, it says Gemo up top, which is Gemini, I don't usually read horoscopes, but I decided what the heck I had to find. Um, and, I, and I read what it said here. It says, you want to look too much into the future. That can ruin the present. 
Take full advantage of what is given to you, and later things will become clear. I didn't fully really know what that meant or appreciate what that meant at the time, but that ended up setting the stage for my entire year in Paris. Um, that's what set up the, the discovery that I went through around where happiness is truly derived from, and it had much more to do with meaningful interaction with people than anything else. Bottom line, I discovered that my personal wealth had nothing to do with my bank account. The interesting thing is, after my year in Paris, I came back to the United States, uh, and I was in Boston. I actually went to the, uh, so this is some of my enjoyable time in, in Paris. Back in the States, a year later, I was in Boston at the JFK Museum with my dad and my brother. And we walked into the museum, and I don't know if you've been, but the first thing you do, you walk into a beautiful, huge theater. Um, and with theater quality sound, you hear the booming voice of JFK come over the loudspeaker. Um, and he said this. He said, the great enemy of truth is often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. And I had one of those aha moments that you'll always remember. Everything came together. I realized that I had just spent a year in Paris having one heck of an experience, and what I uncovered, what I realized, was I was living this myth. I was living in a world in which money and happiness went hand by hand or hand in hand. And what I discovered firsthand was that was absolutely not true. And so this idea of myth being persistent, persuasive, and powerful is also not true. So that led me down a particular path. Um, I wouldn't actually act on that path uh, for, for years, four years later. Um, I was caught up in the myth, at least my myth, I was caught up in the myth that getting a job in finance or consulting was what you did because it was well paid and well respected. I didn't go down the path of doing what I love because that would have, that would have been the thing that would have made me fulfilled. Um, and it took time. It actually, it actually took a, I had to lose somebody very special in my life, um, in a very personal way, to actually get me to reshift my focus on priority years later. And it was after that experience, after that loss, that I had realized that um, I had nothing really else to fear um, in taking action that was more in line with the myth that I discovered in Paris. And so, and so, what did I do? Um, I, I basically put myself on a path to do the thing that I was passionate about, to do the thing that I found purpose in. Uh, and so what I did, I just followed, followed my heart. I followed those things that I was passionate about uh, and that I felt had purpose. I rediscovered some of the literary classics. I read books on creativity and leadership. I did a triathlon. I couldn't swim two laps without losing my breath. But I still committed to doing a triathlon. And I did. It was one stroke right after the other, a step-by-step -step process, where I committed I was going to do this, even though I couldn't really see how it was going to happen. But I committed myself to it, and I did it. I also decided I wanted to start playing piano. <clears throat> and so I bought a piano. I started taking lessons. I started writing songs after just six months. Songs I had no business writing. But I wrote those songs. And to this day, I play them when I want to hear them. I started interviewing very successful people. Or at least I was interested in how very successful people reach certain heights of their success. So I started a blog called The Pop Kernel. You used to be able to put it into Google. Uh, and it was number one, now I think like number four or five. I haven't been active for a while. But 
called the pop kernel. The idea was, <clears throat> why is it that certain people reach certain heights of success and others don't? And I thought, well, what better way to find out than to go talk to those people who've reached certain levels of success? Long story short, I found myself in situations next to Time, Reuters, Business Week, and then me, covering people like George Lucas, Al Gore, Jack Welch, and one of my favorites, the Dalai Lama. I then wanted to go to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Not because I had a ticket, I didn't. <laughs> I, I wasn't invited. Um, I didn't even have a place to stay. There were no hotel rooms left in a 20 mile radius of Davos. I know this because I called every single hotel within a 20 mile radius of Davos. But I really wanted to go. And so I committed myself to going. Not knowing exactly how things would unfold, but willing myself to make it work. And so I think what's what's important here is that I was starting to I was starting to discover um, I was starting to discover the power of commitment. And when I read this quote by a Scottish mountain climber, William H. Murray, everything clicked. What he says is, until one is committed, there is always hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always unaffected. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help that never otherwise would have occurred. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. What I want to focus on, and what I certainly focused on, was that piece in the middle that's golden. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. What does that even mean, I ask myself. And over time, what I discovered is that there are certain things that you cannot possibly plan or foresee, but that if you commit yourself to doing something, truly committing yourself to doing something, the universe actually conspires to make things happen for you. I know that sounds nuts. It sounds really nuts. Right? My excuse is I'm from California. <laughs> so I kind of buy this stuff. Right? Um, but frankly, I didn't really buy it until I, until I experienced it for myself. And so things that seemed impossible, doing a triathlon, writing music after just six months, meeting people like Sheryl Sandberg and Eric Schmidt and the Queen of Jordan at the World Economic Forum, this had become my new reality. And it's become my new reality because I committed myself to it. So the point, the bottom line point here is I had been disrupted. Paris had uncovered my myth. Loss had pushed me to action it. And commitment was my secret weapon to making things work. Now I was the one in a position ready to do the disrupting. So I committed myself to starting a company. I decided to go to business school and start one. I experienced firsthand the personal pain of the student loan process and realized the market was completely broken and needed fixing. That's when I decided I would take my entrepreneurial commitment down that path. Over the last two years, Common Bond has completely consumed me. It has just taken its claws and hasn't let go in all this time. Um, and I'm okay with that. Not because it's not the most difficult and most intense thing I've ever done in life. It is. But I wake up for the first time in my adult life wanting to do nothing else every single day. That to me is incredibly powerful. So I would implore all of you, to the extent you haven't yet, to find your Paris. Think less about disrupting an industry and more about disrupting your own myth. 
then commit to a path of purpose. Because uncovering your purpose and what makes you tick and what you are passionate about is what you will need to develop the capacity and the mental fortitude to face resistance you will undoubtedly face as someone looking to disrupt an industry. Real disruption starts with you. Thank you.